Dr. Carol Van West will be speaking about um, uh, his perspective over 40 years of uh, looking at historic properties in Montana. Uh, Dr. West is the director of the Center of Historic Preservation at Middle Tennessee State University. His role at the center uh, includes uh, his direction of the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area, which is statewide, um, and he is the Tennessee State Historian. Preservation focus is on properties associated with the civil rights movement, the Civil War, rural areas, marginalized communities, and the Southern music industries. Um, despite a strong Tennessee uh, direction to his work, Dr. West also has a equally strong Montana connection, which started in the 1980s when the Montana State Historic Preservation Office sought him out to develop historic contexts for Montana that go beyond the landmarks. And these include uh, a look at broader patterns in Montana's history. Uh, his four decades old work is still relevant and is essential to one's understanding of Montana. Because his narrative or the historic narrative never ends, Dr. West continues his Montana work and you can see it through his Montana historic landscape blog. So uh, this morning, he's going to share his 40-year pers perspective, 4-0 perspective, 14, uh, on Montana and its historic place. Good morning, Montana. Great to see so many people here. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of the conference today. What I worked on 40 years ago, and I started this fall, I started in September of 1983 was a new approach to preservation planning for the state. The state already had a preservation plan, but really it was just a listing of different known properties. And the National Park Service had recently amended the 1980, uh, amended in 1980, the National Preservation Law to include the creation of tribal preservation officers certified local governments, and so much of the sort of grassroots of the movement that we know of today. So with that, they wanted to create a new planning process, which of course, if it's led by a group of anthropologists and archeologists, sorry, sir, uh, Crystal, um, uh, it ends up becoming a process. And they called it the Resource Protection Planning Process, or RP3 is what it was always referred to. And it was designed, as Pete talked about, to broaden our understanding of how to think about historic properties. And I think, you know, it was a successful program in Montana. A lot of states sort of ignored it or didn't really implement it. But it has been interesting to see how it's evolved over the years here. And of course, that's what Sarah and Crystal will be talking about, how we do think about properties today. But since the theme of the conference is building on the past, well, I'm the old guy to talk about the past and then they'll do the rest of it. Uh, now, in 1983, no one really knew what RP3 was, but I give great credit to Marcella Sherpy, who was then the State Historic Preservation Officer because she wanted to make it work for the state. So it was designed to have sort of three distinct components, survey and public meetings. In other words, I traveled the state. And if you don't believe me, they have the mileage records to prove it. 25,000 miles in Montana in a four month period. Uh, it was typically seven to seven every day uh, to, you know, get into stuff. And then a meeting at night on like 15 different nights to, you know, talk about the plan, but also to learn, learn, learn. So then it was the document that the State Historic Preservation Office had, the Historic Context Plan. And then there was a book that then came about a year later. So I started the survey on the High Line because in my, at that time, limited understanding of Montana history, 
I learned so much through this whole program. You know, the Great Northern Railroad was really important. And I also felt, okay, Eastern Montana gets neglected. Um, everything, so much of the documentation in the SHPO was about the Western part of the state or about the cities and not so much about the rural part of the state. And this is what the office knew. And they was like, yes, we're going to put you in the car and you can start at Cut Bank and end up over there at the state line at Bainville. But just outside of Bainville is McCabe, which is one of my favorite little towns because that was the post office, as you see there on the, on this in my left. And in the middle, of course, the tracks of the Great Northern Railroad. So sort of using that as a starting point, I started to crisscross the state and ended up only getting into the mountainous parts of Western Montana in May when it was a little bit easier to navigate some of that. Now, this photo here also shows that the documentation that I did, I was given 100 rolls of film. I took over 3000 images you know, some of these places are gone. This is near on the road to Yak up in Lincoln County. And this concentrator is gone today. And so too are a lot of the railroad depots along the Great Northern R Route. Some of them have been moved. Some of them have become museums. But you go back on some of that and these sort of corporate signposts out there in the landscape saying, well, it might be your town, but we created it by our railroad lines and our plats. And you know, some of these are gone today, some of them are still there. The Plenty Wood one is there. That's a Northern Pacific Depot way up there in the corner of the state as the railroad lines would crisscross. But I've always regretted that we've lost pretty much all physical traces of the Sioux Line Railroad that came through Sheridan and Daniels County. A lot of people didn't know about that. I certainly didn't until I got into that part of the state. And, you know, there it is, a combination depot, even with its privy still intact in 1984. And when I went back there about seven or eight years ago, there is nothing there, except the tracks are still there. Sometimes the elevators are still there. So that was one goal to start understanding the state as a comprehensive landscape that small towns mattered as much as everything else. And to have meetings and listen to the folks and, in Montana's rural towns. Another very important goal was to acknowledge the deeper past and the indigenous presence. This, I think, was the controversial part of my work. As I developed the historic context, there were seven different themes covering, you know, transportation, resource development, um, sort of commonalities that you have over the centuries. I did not make a division between archaeology and history. And I know I made some of my anthropology friends quite mad. Back in 1984, there were some, let's say, spirited discussions. But I still think that's a distinction that I understand in a disciplined way but really, the deeper past here is Native American. It never went away. Just because there's not a historical document doesn't mean there's not stories, there's not places, there's not traditions. And it's interesting how now new researchers really changing our perspective of that. And you know, you just have to mention Bear Gulch, for example, and didn't know about this in 1984. But properties like that really expand our understanding. And, you know, I've seen how these efforts have changed as well. At Kootenai Falls in 1984, you sort of parked on the side of US-2 and then you snaked your way across through the forest and went right on the tracks. No viewpoint, no interpretation, no nothing. But when I met with Salish and Kootenai people, they were like, this is one of our most important places. This is a place you have to go to. Now you can go and that's interpreted. So, you know, to me, this was an important component of this is making sure that you don't treat the Native American past 
as a prehistory, it's all history. It's all history. It's all taking place within this landscape through generations and generations of people. And that's a good place to start. Now, this attitude of mine really was fed by the public meetings. And this, I found this actually once they said, yeah, come and talk about this at the conference. I found my old listing of the places I went to and did public meetings. And then I did constituent meetings, meaning sort of direct uh, smaller meetings with agencies, universities, tribes. And so, you know, that was a constant part of this is hearing what people said. And I tried to take as good as notes as I could of all of these places. And I have used these notes ever since because what it told me is what people 40 years ago thought was important. Now, today they might see it differently. They might not think that is so important, but that did lead me to such places as the railroad hotel in Seiko and then the community centers across the state. Um, never really thought about community centers. This was not something you were taught about in school. This idea that rural people needed places to knit themselves together because they lived far away. Schools were often that purpose. Churches were often that purpose, but then this concerted effort to build community halls. So just for this talk, I was here in May and I went, I went and chased down Kenilworth Hall. Does anyone know where this is in Shoto County? Thank you. Would you, dis, would you say that it's sort of in the middle of nowhere? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great comment. I would fully agree there's lots of nowhere places. And of course, the people around here, this is not in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, it's not on a, a place you would commonly find. And look, it's still there, really not that different in condition as it was 40 years before. Well, this is near. You go to Big Sandy and you sort of then go west. <laughs> And, you know, you go, you know, and then the, and then you run into it. It's what, 15 miles or so from Big Sandy, something like that. It's still new. Yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, it's just, I mean, what a statement of persistence, community values, everything that we talk about that we want to protect today. Uh you know, schools were always a focal point. That was something that the office really did want me to dive into were schools. And of course, since then, you've had the rural school project. There's been so much work with schools, but I still find them so powerful. Uh, the one here in the bottom from Shawmut was a New Deal constructed school, pretty well intact in 1984, not changed it much at all but it is still there today. It has been changed some, but not that much. You still see the same school from 40 years ago, although it's closed. And this is one of the great issues in preservation in the state now for rural Montana is closing, you know, declining populations in lots of the state. And what do we do with these community landmarks from that time? Now, we don't have to worry so much about these community landmarks because, you know, another real source of information for me was bars. Because guess what? When I went into a bar and said a word, you talking about everyone turning to look? Where in the world, where in the world did this guy come from? Now, I would say my accent then was not as strong as it is now, but it was pretty strong. and. Uh, and then I would talk about, well, you know, I'm trying to find stuff. I'm trying to learn. What do you know? And, you know, some people are like, I don't give a about, about that. But then other people would be like, yeah, you know, that's that's good. Let me call someone and they'll come over to the bar and talk to you about it. Now, of course, some of these places from a preservation standpoint would have changed, like Sweet's Place in Drummond. The building is still there, but it's a new business and it's lost its neon sign. And then down at uh, Wise River, well, you know, I went in there just a few years, you know, a few years ago 
And it was like, yeah, I surveyed this back then. And, you know, it was so interesting. All of the antlers on the front, I thought it really defined the building. But I guess, you know, you had to take those off. Oh, no, let's show you. So they had taken them off and then put them on the ceiling in one of the sort of special dining rooms. So it was like, no, it's still there. And it's like, you know, this is where you really start to understand just because a building changes its appearance doesn't mean it's lost its importance as a real community landmark. Now, another category we looked a lot at it were churches, both still standing from the 19th century, but also starting to look at the ethnic churches like the one from Lenape. And again, you wonder uh, the wonders of the internet. I did a posting about the Lenape church and then I had a writer from Germany contact me and then he sent me the two page spread special issue, the special article they did about the Lenape community and its connections back to this place in Europe. And uh, now I can't read it, but you know, it was, uh, it was interesting that they were, you know, again, trying to make that connection between their own past and what they saw as a Montana presence. Now, a property type that we didn't address on purpose in 1984 were cemeteries. Cemeteries were just not something that people were contacting the State Preservation Office about. It wasn't something that was a big dis discussion uh, subject within preservation. So I did document some cemeteries, but really I didn't do much at all. And that's what I've been doing the last two or three years is trying to look at at least one represented representative cemetery, usually the municipal cemetery in each of the counties. I'm not quite gotten that done, but I'm close to it. And you can see a lot of results of that because cemeteries become the way to tell larger stories because they can be segregated in different ways by faiths. Typically in this state, in my state, it's you know, usually racial division, divisions and faiths. Uh, like the Jewish uh, people are buried with African-American people, and then that's a separate cemetery from the white cemetery in, in the South. So here the, it's different, but cemeteries still tell these big, powerful stories. And my Bozeman colleagues know I love Sunset Hill Cemetery there in Bozeman. It can just do so much. So this is what the survey did. It was trying to look at representative properties across the state. Um, I did take over 3,000 photographs again. Uh, they are weighted to community buildings. We really didn't worry so much about private homes because the focus on, was on where Montanans interacted, where they created things, be it industry, be it community, be it schools, be it churches. So the end result was the report, which you can contact Pete and he would, can send you a copy of it. And the book, which I understand is still available. They did a second edition of it a few years ago. It came out in 1986. Now, what was important about all of this? To me, it was important because it was all about creating a different approach to the preserved past that there was much more to historic preservation than urban architecture. And some of you know, I've since written a book about Billings, so I have nothing against urban areas, but in my time in the field, God, it was so much focus on just urban areas and great buildings and famous architects. Well, that's good, but that's not the way to really build a powerful preservation movement. Historical and cultural landscapes matter. That was hammered away both in the plan and in the book. The book is organized around 23 cultural landscapes. Uh, we really emphasize the vernacular and the commonplace matter, which folks was a controversial idea in the early to mid 1980s. That was not the accepted truth that it is today in preservation. Also not accepted back then was that the 20th century matters. 
So much of the early work was all about the 19th century from the territorial period through the War of the Copper Kings. In fact, I know Janet Orr is here. She was in one of those constituent meetings in Butte back then, and that was something Janet was already pushing against in Butte, that the only thing to talk about was the War of the Copper Kings instead of the huge ethnic history story that Butte embodies. So again, it all got down to community-driven, people-centered. That's how good work gets accomplished. And in my time since then, I've taken that gospel to the East. And some of you have encountered some of my graduate students throughout the years. Um, I've directed now over 150 MAs. I've got 50 PhD students. And a lot of them run their own academic programs. And this is our common link, community-driven, people-centered preservation. I learned that here. You guys, through the community meetings, through the professional meetings, help me gain that insight. So I tried to carry it out still in projects today. For three years and on Thursday, we had a planning meeting in Butte to set up the fourth year. I have worked with the Benai Israel Congregation, the Butte Civil Bowl Archives and the City Preservation Office that I provide a summer intern to develop exhibits, to do public lectures, to do tours of the synagogue as part of an ethnic cultural center approach to Butte's history. Now, for me, it's the benefit the students get from this. They get a real different experience than they do back in the South, and it just propels them into the field. All of the students who have done this are now, you know, they're really going to be superstars in the field, and you guys are helping that. And then my own side project, the Montana Historic Landscapes block. Um, Mark Baumler asked me back 12 years ago, boy, we really wish you could come back and sort of do a new photography overview of the state, but you know, we don't have any money. And I know the SHPO didn't have any money. They didn't have much in the 1980s, but they don't have it near that today. Um, so I said, Mark, I think we can make a deal here. I don't want to do a report. I want to do a website that then all of the photography is shared and you can go in there and pull stuff on any place. And, you know, I have worked in the last 10 years to populate this site and to uh, provide images that you guys can use in your work, in your classrooms, in your studies. I know most recently I, I am concerned about the Isaac Walton Inn in Essex. It's a very important building. It's changed ownership. They've sold a lot of the artifacts out of the building. They're going to, what they're going to do with it is unclear. And this was one of the first two National Register nominations I worked on in the state. So it's not only important, it's sort of personal. But you can find a lot of things there. I always will remember the journalist who contacted me and said, you are the only person who has high resolution images of Circle Montana. <laughs> <laughs> and then this next question was, why? <laughs> so I told, I told him the story that when I went there for the public meeting, you know, it was during the basketball season, during the tournaments. And I you saw that Circle was going to be in a big game in Miles City. So I went to the museum director there, and, and his name was Orville Quick. Some of you probably remember Orville. And I said, Orville, you know, let's reschedule this for another trip as I'm looping around in this region. And he says, no, Van, I want to hear what you got to say. I want to hear all about it. And... Uh, don't worry, I'll have a crowd there. And I thought, there's going to be no one there. They're all going to be down in Miles City. Well, who I had was Orville and all of the grandmas keeping the kids because the rest of the family was down in Miles City. 
But of course, actually, those were people I wanted to hear from because they had lived there for decades. So, you know, this is where coming to Montana and trying to get back to you guys, you gave so much to me early in my career. I just have to acknowledge a few people by name. That's me in front of the two dot bar uh, 40 years ago. And my plan is to get a similar photo at the two dot bar tomorrow. So thank you.